Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. Tonight, we are going to continue our discussion on the F3 Nimzo, as I cover more and more and more lines. Uh, I'm reminded of just how deep this opening is and just how much there is to discover and how much there is to know. So tonight, we are going to continue talking about what happens when black castles on move four. Uh, in the previous lecture, we discussed a pretty surprising knight jump out to h5, and tonight we are going to discuss an even more surprising knight jump back to the to the 8th rank, knight e8. So to understand what that's all about, I want to start with the game between Sergei Volkov and Arturs Nyksons. And now you may know the name Arturs Nyksons from his blossoming Twitch career, I believe he has started. But in this game, he was on the uh, unfortunate end of a game against Sergei Volkov, F3 Nimzo, uh, master. So let's see what happened here. We started with d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, entering the Nimzo Indian, f3, entering the f3 Nimzo Indian, um, and then black castles. Again, this is what we're discussing. a3, takes, takes, and then this is the, the first real decision point for black. Now, in the previous lecture, we discussed how black can try and prevent the move of e4 by white with the idea of knight out to h5. And the point was now, of course, if e4, there's queen h4. And after knight h3, black's idea was to go f5 and control e4. And so while knight h5 was perhaps a little bit surprising to a lot of people, myself included, it did have the very clear idea of defending uh, the e4 square. Now this move that we're going to talk about tonight is on the same turn, rather than advance the knight out to h5, black can occasionally retreat the knight to e8. And at first glance, this looks absolutely ridiculous. White is going to take over the center with the move e4, and all of black's pieces are back on the starting rank. Uh, all black has managed to do is trade off the only piece that got off the back rank and move the other piece back to it. So what is the point? Well, to understand a move like knight e8, I wanted to start with a game where knight e8 wasn't played. And maybe that'll help us understand why this move is sort of necessary by black. So in this game, knight sons actually just starts with the more natural c5. Why is this slightly more natural? Well, black's idea is to, number one, challenge the d4 square a little bit, and number two, go for a big attack on the c4 pawn using these queen side pieces. This is black's main idea in the knight e8 line. Going b6, knight c6, knight a5, and bishop a6 to apply pressure here. So c5 is essentially an attempt to improve it. You know, why waste time on knight e8 when we can get going with this stuff right away? Challenge the dark squares in the center, then play this knight out to a5, and call it a day, you know, show white what's going on. So first, white should just continue naturally with the move e4. There's no reason not to. Then we're going to look at the move d6, guarding this c pawn. Notably, if uh, black were to start with the move knight c6, then perhaps the move e5 would be strong by white, highlighting the fact that this pawn has not yet moved out to d6. So d6 first is a bit more accurate. Now we get bishop d3, and now knight c6. And so far, so good for black, right? Everything's going according to plan. Uh, maybe it is going to turn out to be true that knight e8 was a waste of time. Well, now white continues with knight e2, and black continues with the plan with b6. But now, perhaps the point of knight e8 is going to become clear after white's next move. And it turns out, rather surprisingly, that bishop g5, I think, is an excellent move here for white that is going to force some positional concessions by black. In black's perfect world, white would have just continued with something like bishop e3, black would have time to go bishop a6, let's say white castles, and then knight a5, and black, white is simply losing a pawn on c4. Nothing really to be done here about it, and it's going to be black who's better. But with this move bishop g5, white is actually making some very, very serious threats very, very uh, quickly, very rapidly. So for example now, if black were to continue with something like bishop a6, does anybody in the chat know what white would do to continue? White to move here and essentially win the game. Uh, 
white to move and essentially win the game. What do you guys have for me? So Jonas has the right idea. White would love to play e5, but slightly wrong execution. If you play e5 here, black is simply going to take it two times, and then your center is gone. So the best move for white is actually the move f4, and this creates the threat of e5, and it turns out this threat is quite simply impossible to stop. Uh, if you play h6, white will simply retreat the bishop. If you take on d4, I will simply take back and e5 is going to come. Uh, e5 by black doesn't really help. White is going to castle, and now even if I'm not playing pawn to e5, my pressure down the f-file is going to decide the game. Um, for example, let's, I don't know, it's hard to suggest a move. Let's say rook e8, I'm going to take e5 and take f6, and this is just totally busted for black. Your castle is broken. So, f4 is the threat, and it would in fact just be winning after a nonchalant move like bishop a6. But of course, Nixons is a strong grandmaster and plays the move e5. And so seemingly, this threat of bishop g5 has very, you know, summarily been dealt with. What was the point of drawing this pawn out to e5? Well, we'll see that Volkov actually sort of tailors his play around the fact that black has been forced to make these slight concessions in the center, put this pawn onto e5, and give white some targets to go after. So Nixons now continues, or sorry, Volkov continues with d5. The pressure on d4 was mounting. Uh, knight a5 by black now. And we see our first remaneuvering of knight to g3. It's important to play this move before castling, because now we can respond to bishop a6 with queen, e queen to e2. And for the moment, we are going to be holding on to our c4 pawn. Uh, this particular game continued with h6, bishop back to e3, rook e8, um, and then Sergei Volkov makes a few inaccuracies here. He plays the move a4, which is seemingly a natural move, but I just don't think it's totally relevant here. But we will stick with the game a4 played. It uh, doesn't really give away too much at all. Black is not better by any stretch, and I think white has a small, small pull still, just not the most useful move. Perhaps a bit better would be the simple kingside castles, queen e2, queen c2, any of these moves, but a4 is perfectly fine. Uh, the game continues with knight d7, and now white continues with h4. So the plans are beginning to become uh, a little bit more clear. Uh, this is the sort of position that white is aiming for when you get this blocked off center. White has very mobile king side pawns, and Sergei Volkov is going to look to attack the black king on the king side. In the meantime, the thing to look at for black is where is the activity on the queen side? And thanks to these slight concessions that were, that were forced because the bishop came out to g5, uh, those concessions being putting the pawn on d6, putting the pawn on e5, and putting the pawn on h6. Well, now black has no way to open up the c file to get at this pawn, no way to challenge the c pawn with d5, no way to open the e file to place a knight on e5. All of these moves are not available to black, and for those reasons, black is sort of without counterplay on the queen side, and is going to have to spend the rest of the game defending on the king side. And we'll see that that is no easy task. So all in all, it's easy to say black plays knight e8 because of bishop g5, but the uh, real details are a lot trickier and are very important to understand. So why does, white, why does black play knight e8? Yes, it's because of bishop g5, but more specifically, it's because of these concessions that bishop g5 is going to force. Black is going to need to concede some things in order to get that bishop off of g5, and it turns out it's simply better for black just to not allow bishop g5 in the first place by playing this awkward-looking move, knight e8. Um, with all that talking, though, let's see it in action. How did Volkov continue this game? Well, uh, Nixons plays the move knight to f8, trying to defend the king side a little bit more. As I said, it's going to be tough to find any counterplay on the queen side. You can play bishop a6, but queen e2 is simple enough to deal with the threat. Uh, the game continues now with the funny looking king f2, just developing the king. Notably, this rook is well placed on the h file, and f2 is a safe square for the king. 
Uh, knight g6 was the continuation. And then uh, Volkov plays a very excellent move in the form of knight h5. Volkov does not care about losing the h-pawn in order to open up this rook's access to the king's side. And with knight h5, he's making the very serious threat of playing g4 on the next turn, following that up with g5, exploding the king's side. And thirdly, uh, this move is also stopping the idea of knight f4. Knight h5, sort of the perfect move here for white, and it's going to give white some advantage. The game continued with knight takes h4. Now g3 forces this knight back away. Knight g6, and now white to move again, chat. What is the move to seize the winning advantage here for white? <clears throat> yes, as always, this is, of course, uh, ben Feingold's least favorite opening, but we do what we can without his support as well. We do what we can. Um, so the idea is actually a little bit surprising if uh, you've been listening to everything I've been saying so far. You know, I mentioned that this e5 move is a little bit of a concession in part because black is unable to get pressure down the e-file and unable to occupy this square with the pieces. So it might not be your first instinct to play the move f4 and grant black this sort of counterplay, but in this case, this is the correct move. White is going to open the g-file and deliver checkmate shortly. Uh, by the way, you guys did have a good idea with knight takes g7, didn't want to discount this. This move wins as well, but a wise man once told me, you know, sometimes it's, it's better to win with all your pieces on the board than to win with, uh, with a knight missing, you know. Why is that? Well, if you make a few inaccuracies, you might find yourself down a piece. Whereas here, you are not going to find yourself down a piece. And if you make a few inaccuracies, probably your position is still going to be okay. So. When in doubt, don't sacrifice pieces if your position is already good. That's just good practical chess. Um, no need to take unnecessary risks. Uh, the game continued, though, with e takes f4, g takes f4. Now queen e7, applying pressure down the e file. And then things went a little bit crazy with queen e2, knight c4, bishop c4, and queen takes e4. Black sacrificing a piece to get back into the game. But now white is up a piece and should go on to win the game. Uh, we are well out of the scope of opening theory here, so I'm going to leave it at that. There was a little bit more back and forth left in the game, but white's up a piece should be good enough for a victory. So let's recap what happened this game. Let's recap what happened. Uh, black chose instead of the normal knight e8 to continue with the immediate c5. And to understand why this is less popular, why this is maybe not quite as good, we saw e4 by white, d6 by black, bishop d3, knight c6, knight e2. And then after black begins this plan of going knight, a, knight a5 and bishop a6, we see white develop out with bishop g5 and start forcing these concessions uh, by black. And we are going to return to this one more time at the end of the lecture if we have time, because perhaps a better try than the move e5, which has been played twice, is the move h6, which has been played zero times. So that's just some home cooking I have for you guys there uh, about this move h6, because I do think it could potentially be an interesting try for black. That being said, though, I don't want to waste all you guys' time analyzing something that's never been played, so we are going to return to the most common move, which is knight e8, with our first main game of the knight between uh, someone by the name of Gunter Heike and someone by the name of Vilmars Korsens, very famous chess players. Uh, they are not super GMs by any means, but the line I'm going to be recommending is actually a little bit more of an offbeat line. So I'm going to get into what that is exactly, but first I'm just going to show sort of an example of how the main line theory goes and why I'm actually not recommending that for white. So we are going to start with the main line stuff, of course all f3 Nimzo stuff, castles a3, we're looking at takes takes and knight e8, still going e4 here, it's the only move that makes sense. And now black's idea, as stated, is very very simple. Black is going to pile up on this pawn. We see bishop d3, bishop a6, 
Uh, knight c6 is also a perfectly playable move. It doesn't really change anything for us. Uh, so bishop a6, and now the move I am recommending is the slightly strange looking move a4. And I do think this is a great way for white to apply some pressure to black's position. Now the main line move here is a little bit more natural. It is continued with the na natural move uh, knight h3. So I just want to take a quick look at this and talk a little bit about why I'm not going to recommend this line. So the play is pretty linear here. Most of the games go the same way. Black has this one little plan and is going to do it. We see castles, now knight a5, queen e2. And once again, the difference between this knight e8 line and the line with the knight on f6 starts to become clear when black plays the move c5. Now, d5 would be a natural move for white to try to play, but it's simply not going to be very good here. For one, black is able to capture on d5 versus the other line with the pawn on e5. And for two, black can sort of just leave this pawn here, even occasionally play the move knight d6, and the pressure on c4 is in fact mounting. Whereas in that first game that we saw, black's play on the queen side sort of faded away and we never really saw you know, anything concrete happen against these pawns. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, the main move for white is not d5 for those reasons. The main move is e5, trying to deliver checkmate. Turns out bishop takes h7 is a real threat, so black should respond with the move f6. And there are a couple options here, including rook a2 to c2, which I talked about at the end of the last lecture. Uh, and the more analysis that I did on it, the, the less I sort of liked it. But the idea is the same as in bishop f4. Uh, you just get your pieces out, but black is succeeding in pressuring uh, this pawn on c4. And here, black will just continue with the move d5. And after a quick pawn sacrifice, uh, White is not really going to be able to keep this pawn with pressure on d4 and c4 mounting. And I found no possible way to break through with an advantage for white in these cases. Notably, uh, black is also able to first play rook c8, rook ac1, and, and follow this up with d5 as well. And the lines stay, stay largely the same, and they stay perfectly fine for black. The further you dig into these lines, the less problems black actually has. And if you're not careful, white may actually end up on the worst end of some endgames with this weak d4 pawn. For example, let's say something like this. Take here, take here, um, take on d3, take on d3, queen takes d5. And it's actually going to be white uh, facing some pressure on this structure. Uh, white still has some threats on the king's side, and black definitely still has problems to solve. But honestly, I prefer the black side of these positions. Uh, this is actually my preferred line against the f3 Nimzo whenever I end up on the black side of it. And for good reason. I think black doesn't really have any major issues here. And if white isn't careful, white's going to end up on the worst end of things. So what am I recommending instead? Well, I'm recommending sort of a more measured approach by white. Rather than going all out, overextending our pawns out to e5 early on, I'm recommending this move a4 in part because it grants white some flexibility and partly because it introduces some very concrete threats that black will have to solve at the risk of being worse. If black doesn't really play correctly here, black is going to be under quite a great deal of pressure. So what is the idea of a4 other than to play some sort of random waiting move? Well, the point is, of course, bishop a3. When due to the awkward placement of black's pieces, this rook is actually borderline trapped. And we'll see that in our main line here, this rook may end up getting captured. So how should black respond? Well, this position has actually been reached only 14 times in the Lee Chess database on move 14. And black has played knight c6 11 times. So that's what we're going to start with here. I think this is, you know, it's fair to say that this is the main variation. Uh, now white should continue as planned with bishop a3, forcing this pawn out to the d6 square. And from here, the move f4 is going to be the natural continuation. So sort of similar to what we saw in the bishop g5 line, except in this case, our bishop is planted on a3, 
and we're not really threatening e5. f4 is more of just a move to take some extra space and grant this knight the f3 square. Let's see how play might continue. Knight a5 is the most natural. Now queen e2 defends the c4 pawn. And we're going to look at this move c5. This is, of course, the natural continuation of black's play. This is the main plan for black in these positions, and there's no reason why black should deviate from that here. Uh, white's going to continue with knight f3. That's part of the reason why we played the move f4. And from here, you can very much expect black to continue with rook c8. This is, as stated, sort of the main idea for black. Now we're going to look at the move e5 for white. I think this is the way to go in this case. And what is going on in this position? Well, it's very similar to what we just looked at in the main line with a few key differences. Namely, if black starts trying to liquidate things, as we saw in the previous line, it's not going to be white who ends up with a random d4 weakness. It's going to be black who ends up with weak a3 to f8 diagonal. And black is going to have to sacrifice an exchange if they decide they want to open things up like this. So I want to start with what happens if black does, in fact, sacrifice that exchange. And then we're going to take a look at a slightly different game to show what happens if black sort of chickens out and says, no, I don't want to sacrifice this rook. That's a little bit too scary. And what chances white has there? So black is going to start with the move g6. Most likely, this has been played five of the six times we've seen this position. Uh, apparently, the move h6 has also been played, but this sort of looks like some nonsense to me. I don't really understand this move. I think it's just a bad move. White should continue with castles. But g6 is what we're focusing on. And here, white simply castles kingside. And now in the game, uh, Vilmar's Corzins, one way or the other, decided that this rook had to go. So I keep saying that black is going to have to sacrifice this piece, but I haven't said how, so let's take a look. The most natural move is c takes d4 for black. That was the point of rook c8. That was the point of all these moves. Indirectly, that was sort of the point of knight to e8, pressuring this d4 pawn to open up the c file. That is black's plan, so of course black should be inclined to go for it. White's going to play c takes b d4 back, of course. And now, after bishop takes c4, white can actually apply some pressure with the move not bishop takes c4, drawing this knight into the game, but with rook a to c1. And what's going on here? Well, white is, of course, applying pressure down this c file. And if this bishop moves out of the way, you can expect e takes d6 to come with a lot of problems for black to solve. And that's exactly what happens in this game. Black chooses bishop d5. We see rook takes c8. Queen takes c8. e takes d6. And now, all of a sudden, it's very unclear how black is going to be able to save this rook. And in fact, this turns out to just be an impossible task. Uh, if you try knight f6, for example, then d7 can still come, among other moves. Maybe rook c1 first is even better. Uh, but at the very least, there's d7, and bishop takes f8. Um, and if queen to d8, as played in the game, again, this move d7, now this is the best that white can do. Black is going to take the pawn, uh, and white throws in a nice little intermezzo. You can also just take the rook immediately, but this intermezzo protects our a4 pawn for the moment. And now we see that simplifications do happen. Knight c7, bishop f8, king takes f8. And here, white is going to be slightly better. Is it enough for uh, a full point? Likely against good play, it is not going to be enough for a full point. Uh, I think black should have very, very good chances to draw this endgame. But, you know, an exchange is an exchange. And I think practically, if you end up in this position uh, in an over-the-board chess game, I know I myself would be quite happy with what I got out of the opening. Uh, this is the type of position where white is going to be able to play a ton of moves, and black is sort of just going to have to try and find some sort of de defensive setup and just sit back and, and let it happen. So this, I think, is the best that black can do if black is going to go for this sort of normal plan. right? If black is continuing on, you know, as if it were the status quo, this is the type of thing black is, is going to be able to expect. 
Uh, the game itself continued with the immediate queen d1, which is not my favorite move. I think trading the queens is actually going to be favorable for black. But the game ended in a draw pretty peacefully, with white being unable to shake loose these powerful knights and get at this a pawn effectively. Uh, a few more moves were played, and at the end of the day, the a pawns were traded, the knight was traded for the bishop, and a draw was agreed uh, after rook d7. So that is sort of the crux of our opening line here. I am recommending this move 12a4. Is it 12? I guessed wrong. It's not 12. 9a4, way back on move 9. And I'm recommending this move um, in an attempt to make black's main plan less attractive. That's what I love doing against really any opening line. I love taking the plan that my opponent sort of has prepared, that they're knowledgeable about, and playing the move that makes that plan the hardest. Now the main line of this opening, unfortunately, I think the main plan for black is good enough. And against a4, that main plan might be good enough for a half point, but it's going to take a lot of work from black. So of course, this was just only one of the options for the game to continue. And I want to take a look at some of the other uh, questions that I brought up. And to do so, we're going to take a look at a slightly higher level game between someone named uh, Miso Chabalo, or Sabalo maybe, and Erold Dervishi. So yeah, let's just jump into it. No time to waste here. We've got a lot to cover. The game goes d4, knight f6. And I won't waste your time seeing all the moves. We've seen this all before. Again, we are looking at knight e8. Again, white's reply is e4, what else? Now b6 is still going to be black's idea. We have bishop d3, bishop a6. Again, we are going to go with a4. Knight c6, still really the, the only idea for black. We have, or sorry, not the only idea. c5 is an idea that we're going to talk about next. But knight c6, definitely the main idea. Bishop a3 is our response, highlighting that this rook is awkward, drawing this pawn out to d6. And now again, we go f4, forcing play continues with knight a5, queen e2, c5, again, this is the main plan by black. We go knight f3, rook c8, and our move again is e5. And this is the exact same position from the first game. So why am I showing this to you again? Because I want to show you a different middle game continuation. So here, you know, I'm of course playing a little bit of a guessing game, but I suspect black was looking at a lot of these lines. Uh, well, again, we have g6 to guard the f5 square. Uh, and I guess I should mention that if black just plays something uh, sort of nonchalant, like c takes uh, d4, uh, white to move and win in this position is, is actually a good question. So why not something like c takes d4? Let's start with this before I keep talking. Let's start with this. What do you think, chat? And yeah, it is going to be a Greek gift position. Bishop takes h7 is just very, very strong. King h7, knight g5. And after queen h5, black's only move is to sacrifice the queen, which, of course, is going to be very good for white. So not c takes d4, but g6 instead. Now we see castles. And this is where, in the previous game, we saw the players opt to simplify things with c takes d4. Uh, and black ended up sacrificing this exchange on f8, right? Now, in this case, Dervishi perhaps uh, saw these complications and wasn't so happy with the resulting endgame. And as someone in, in the chat said, it is two pieces for the exchange in that endgame. But it, it is very much worth noting that black is left with two knights, which are sort of notoriously difficult to work with in, in endgames. They, they don't work well together. And black's extra pawns are not passed, they are not advanced. In fact, they are slightly weak and, and can quickly become targets. So definitely white for choice in that endgame, although I do suspect it is just a draw. Um, but anyways, I think black saw this endgame coming and said, no thank you, I'll have none of that, and chose the natural move knight to g7. So let's take a look at what happens 
if black decides to leave the pieces on the board, isn't so happy with this exchange sacrifice, which is very difficult to avoid if you do start removing this c-pawn from this diagonal. So knight g7, what's the idea? Well, partially it is hinting at controlling the f5 square. Partially it's just clearing out a square for this rook so that black is not going to have to be losing an exchange in the ensuing complications. Well, what should white do about this? How should we continue? Our idea is not actually going to be going for some sort of crazy king's side attack. That is just not going to be on the cards at this point, partially because we committed our bishop to the queen's side of the board, partially because we just have too many weaknesses to worry about to sort of abandon them and go off king hunting. But what we can do is strengthen our position further with the move rook f to d1, and I think this is just a perfectly good, solid move by uh, white. Now, how is the game going to continue? Well, there are a few different approaches that black can take, and there's unfortunately very few games to sort of take the example of. Um, in this game, we're going to see black captures on e5. Now, why would black capture on e5? Well, the idea is simply to grant black target, uh, grant black access to this target on d4. And notably, if white thinks you know they're being, being very clever and opening up the d file in front of the queen, I don't think this is actually going to be the best continuation here for white. Why is that? Well, it's going to be white that's left with the weakness, and it's going to be rather difficult, in fact to make use of this d6 square. For example, playing my continue, queen c7, knight g5, rook fd8, and if you try something like knight e4, uh, even the move knight e8 here. And it may look like it's black who's on the back foot, but black's pieces all have purpose, and white's pieces, especially this bishop, is now looking a little bit silly on a3. So what should white do? Well, white should take back on e5 with the pawn and keep up this pressure on this diagonal. But for the moment, I do sort of want to discuss what happens if black plays a few moves we've already sort of uh, come to expect from the position. So first of all, if c takes d4, all the same problems are going to be in effect here. And in fact, they are only heightened by the fact that this pawn is hanging uh, pretty much immediately. I think white can in fact just capture on d6. So what about d5? Well, this is a move that we've seen before in the main line of this 98 variation. And this is often a great way for black to sort of break through on this c file. It adds that last little attacker to the c4 pawn before things start to crumble. But in this case, uh, thanks in part to our last move, rook f to d1, we are well prepared to meet this break with c takes d5. Uh, black has to trade these bishops, and now after queen takes d5, well, what's the difference? In the main line, we saw that black was able to take on d4 and sort of give us this d4 weakness that was going to be difficult to get away, uh, to give away. But in this case, white is well prepared to meet queen takes d5, thanks to this rook on d1, with the move d takes c5. And this is, I think, really the purpose behind this move rook f to d1. We want to be able to give away this d4 weakness at a moment's notice, and it turns out here white is simply significantly better with control over this uh, d file, or if black wants to keep the d file, then white will just go up a pawn with c takes b6. For example, queen d3, rook d3, uh, b takes c5 is going to allow us uh, a little bit of pressure here. Notably, this is a huge difference than the positions where there was a pawn on b6. Now our bishop is a useful piece attacking a weakness rather than a dead bishop looking at a protected pawn. And here white is, white is just going to be much better. So again, the main point of the opening is to play against black's natural plans. And if black is going to stay in the game, black is going to, continue, uh, is going to have to continue to play slightly unnatural moves, such as moves like queen c7, queen e7, just keeping the tension. Perhaps this is black's best try, but still white is gonna have a path through. In this case, we are going to be the ones to open things up with something like e takes d6 and d takes c5. Now opening the d file is useful because we have uh, some tactics with bishop takes g6. And the game is by no means over. There's queen takes f4. And things would continue from here, 
in uh, some rather complex tactics. At the very least, we can come back with bishop d3. And here, there's moves like queen e5, knight e5. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down in these specifics, but the point I'm trying to make is that black is sort of in a tough spot if black didn't immediately open things up and go for that exchange down endgame. Why is black in a tough spot? Well, because thanks to our setup, white is just well prepared for any way that black can open the position, be it with d5, be it with c takes d4. And if black chooses not to open the position with some nothing moves, some queen e7, queen c7, then white is ready to open up things with e takes d6 and d takes c5. So black is really sort of left with no good options, aside from perhaps d takes e5, which we are going to look at now. Once again, the correct response is f takes e5, keeping the pressure up on this diagonal on the c5 pawn. This is the point of our a4 opening line. Now the game uh, continued with queen c7, understandably removing the queen from the d file. And now white breaks through with one last accurate move, and that move is d5. I think this is a great move by white, and it's a move that solidifies a distinct advantage um, for Miso Sabalo. Uh, now obviously the game did end in a draw, as you can see on your screens, but white does have a very pleasant edge in this position. The game itself continued with bishop b7, and then here I think white is already making some inaccuracies with the move queen e3. Much, much better would have been d6 when after something like bishop f3, queen f3, queen d7. It's very, very clear that white is on the better side of things, especially after the move g4. This knight is sort of locked out of the game. It can come back to c6. Uh, but this knight especially has nowhere to go. It's sort of trapped in this prison between g7 and e8 for the end, for all of you know eternity until the end of until the end of time. Uh, and this once again is going to be a very pleasant position for white. So that's where that's where we will leave it for this idea, uh, namely because. In the game, white played a very bad move, queen e3, and then black is just able to pretty simply take this pawn for free. And that is, in fact, the end of white's advantage. So, questions on this line, because I feel like it's very, very relevant to understand what's happening here after castles uh, in the spot that, that black finds himself in, right? You have this situation where the natural moves don't really seem to be working, but then if you don't play the natural moves, black is going to be left without a plan, and white is going to be able to open things up favorably after this move, rook f to d1, or rook a to d1 is, is also quite good in these positions. Questions here? The chat is just saying thanks for doing all their prep work for them. You're, you're welcome. Uh, I spent sort of all day on this lecture. Yeah, if you guys like these, these more in-depth opening lectures, please let me know because boy, oh boy, do they take me a long, long time. Boy, oh boy, do they take me a long, long time. Mm. Okay. So, no... Questions on this position in particular. Uh, Peter Peterson is saying, white often avoids the Nimzo with knight f3. Black then prefers to transfer into a qgd. Why is that? And I will very briefly actually answer that question because while it is not sort of specific to our f3 Nimzo, it is worth understanding sort of some of these mechanics that don't often get talked about with the first three moves by white. So. Uh, we are going to leave this here and then take a look at one more sort of situation in this um, knight c6 thing, I, I think. And first and foremost, though, let's talk a little bit about the Nimzo Indian in general. Sort of a weird point to fit this in, I know, but it is worth mentioning that oftentimes you'll see black play this move order and then after knight f3, transpose into you know, the, the normal QGD because white did not allow the Nimzo. So why don't all white players play like this? 
Well, by playing this move, three knight c3, it's true that you allow the Nimzo Indian, but I like allowing the Nimzo Indian because the f3 Nimzo is so strong. And it turns out there is actually a tangible benefit to playing knight c3 rather than knight f3, in that it allows white to play the exchange qgd, which I do myself, and this is sort of seen as a, a pretty good option for white against the qgd. And this is sort of the, the mechanics at play here. So why knight c3 over knight f3? Well, it gives you better options against the qgd, and why do, QGD, why do players transpose into the QGD after knight f3? Well, because white is missing this important c takes d5 option. So important to note there. But let us move on now to our next game between uh, Raul Vant Cattell and Ivo Wantola. I'm getting some real known names on the show today. Why is that? Well, again, it's because I'm recommending some pretty uncommon lines. But these games are still instructive nonetheless. So once again, we have a lot to cover. So let's just do it. D4, knight f6, c4, and again, I've come to realize that it is a waste of everyone's time and my mental energy to say all these things out loud. I will, though, say the relevant details after knight e8. Again, we take over the center with e4. b6, again, black's idea is bishop a6. We develop, bishop a6 comes, and now we play this you know, surprise move of a4, activating this bishop along this diagonal. The play continues in this game with knight c6 one more time. We see bishop a3, d6, f4, all the moves we've seen before. Knight a5, queen e2, c5, knight f3, rook c8, e5, g6, and castles. Right, so now we've seen what happens on knight g7 when black tries to play a bit more slowly, try and prepare things. Uh, it turns out still black cannot open up the position favorably. And then it is actually white who open the, opens, opens the position favorably with e takes d6 and d takes c5. Now let's take one more look at the main plan of c takes d4 because these lines are worth taking a second look at. I think if you play this over the board uh, in long time control chess after some deep thought, your opponent might decide it is going to be necessary to go for this main plan. Because the more you look at moves like knight g7, the more you start to realize black's position is sort of just meaningless. There's, there's no plan, there's nothing to do, and it's quite uh, difficult to play. So c takes d4, we'll take another look at. c takes d4, and then just to refresh everyone's memory, the first game we looked at also goes with bishop takes c4, and we play this move rook a to c1. Now there's a question in chat, I believe, about knight b3. Of course, this is just not a good move. We'll take the bishop. But once again, it's worth reiterating what happened in that first game. We saw bishop d5, and this is sort of the only option for black. I didn't say it was the only option in that first game, but we're going to figure out why it's the only option here. So why is bishop d5 the only option? Well, after bishop d5, we've seen that it does, in fact, lose an exchange by force to this d7 idea. Of course, I didn't mention this either. If queen d7, knight e5, or bishop b5, both of these moves are very, very strong. And d7 anyways, right? And now, in fact, we, we might just be making a queen. So we saw queen d8 in that game, and that's when we got d7. Black uh, lost this rook on f8, but got an end game that is likely going to be drawn. Now, in this case, we're going to see what happens if black goes for this natural plan and then chickens out and plays the move bishop takes d3. This is sort of the, the reasonable alternative that you might expect. So what's happening after bishop takes d3? Well, of course, white is going to take back. Now, to avoid this line of rook takes c8 with e takes d6, black captures on c1. We are going to take back. And then, in the game, black plays this move queen d7. And at first glance, this sort of seems like everything black could hope for, right? You got to play your main plan, you got to simplify things a little bit, and you didn't even have to lose your rook on f8 in exchange. Now, uh, of course, once you look past those surface level things, you start to realize that black is unable to move any pieces, right? You know, we just saw this queen go from d8 to d7, which is great, it's making a threat, but you look at this knight, this knight moves, the d6 pawn falls. You look at this rook, and it has zero legal moves. Obviously, the king's going nowhere. And this knight is starting to look a little bit short on squares, right? Even if it comes back to b7, it's not as if it has a future on c5 or d6. 
and on C6, it's going to be a little bit loose, right? And with these three pieces sort of strewn across the board, I do think white is going to have a pretty pleasant advantage in this case, especially with the pressure on D6. And I should say, this is often just the downside of this knight E8 variation. Uh, in many, many lines, black is going to find themselves with uh, a very tough time actually activating this piece, right? Once you play knight e8, it's difficult to get it back into the game, especially after a pawn lands on e5, as we see here. So nothing too crazy going on in this position. It's just exactly what it seems. Uh, white has sacrificed a pawn on c4, but black can't move any of their pieces and is going to have a very, very difficult time getting anything back into the game. The game continued with the move queen b5, by the way, which is a, a great start, defends the pawn on a4. Black cannot really even consider taking on b5 here. For example, knight b7, rook c8, and black is, is pretty close to losing. Knight g7, rook c7, knight g5, for example, and all pieces hanging for black. Definitely not what you want to be doing. So rather than queen b5, black tried queen back to d8 in the game, perhaps showing once and for all that this position is, in fact, pretty desperate. Um, now, though, it's actually tough to figure out how to break through with white, and that's the problem that, that white actually ran into in the game. And in the actual game, white let the advantage slip away, and black managed to uh, actually come out on top with a victory, which is pretty impressive from this position. So how should white have continued? Well, I think rather than queen b5, the move queen c2 was actually a better idea. Now, it's not too late to go for it. For example, after queen d3, black's best idea is to simply repeat the position with queen d7. And now after queen c2, the idea starts to become a little bit clear. White is just going to invade on the c file, and in doing so, will uh, go after the queen side pawns on a7 and b6, and also come after this d pawn on d6 as well. These are sort of the targets that white is going after, and it is more than, more than enough to make up for the, the one pawn in compensation. White is also thinking about playing the move bishop b4, by the way, you know, temporarily misplacing this knight as well, adding yet another target on this queen side. Now, uh, how is the game actually going to continue? Well, just for example, let's say a6, aiming for b5 to eliminate one of these weaknesses. Bishop b4, for example, knight back to b7, queen c6. And if trades, white is already simply winning, winning the chess game here. Um, black is not really able to put too much, put up too much of a fight. And I think practically, this position is always going to be easier to play with white. So, Questions on this last line that we're going to look at in this particular a4 knight c6 variation. Uh, and once we get through the questions, I am going to talk about this move, c5, which has only been seen three times, but I think is very, very important and is, in fact, black's best move. We've seen that after knight c6, black actually comes under a little bit of pressure. And honestly, the, the best I'm finding for black are these slightly uncomfortable positions where white does have some pull, or of course that exchange down endgame, which is not the most comfortable endgame of all time. So questions here. <clears throat> yeah, and I agree with what the chat room is saying, which is why I'm recommending these lines. Um, against this main move, knight c6, which is by far the most popular, uh, I think white is, is getting you know, the, the more aggressive game, which is in general, I think, a good thing, and, and is getting objectively good positions. Now, are they winning positions? Probably not, but that's a lot to ask out of your opening to be winning all the time. Uh, but now, let us move on to this move of c5, and why this move is a little bit better than knight c6. So let's talk about it in yet another game this time between two players by the names of Shram and Prokop. Again, two nobodies, but they played a pretty good chess game. So let's take a look at it here. We have all the same opening moves. Uh, once again, knight e8. Once again, e4, b5. 
bishop d3, bishop a6, a4 is our big idea. And now we see the introduction of our move c5. And this is a move I actually struggled against a little bit to find a, a good line for white. I had already spent a lot of time on these knight c6 variations, and they were all looking pretty, pretty reasonable for white, pretty decent, as you guys were seeing. But then this move c5 sort of hit me like a truck, and I had to work very hard to find a line that could put any pressure on black at all. So what is the point? Well, the point of c5 is that black is anticipating our idea of bishop a3, and now can back this up with knight c6. What is the difference here? Why don't we just continue as we have in the past with a move like f4? Well, black has one really important idea that black did not have previously, and it sort of changes the entire character of the position. What idea is that? Well, black's pawn has not been committed to d6, and this allows black to play the surprising knight d6. Now, in all those positions we were looking at before, black ended up with this horrible knight on e8, this rook on f8 was trapped, couldn't legally move, and with knight d6, black is solving a lot of those problems. So, bishop a3 simply isn't going to be the right idea in this case. Notably, by the way, there is one sort of forcing variation with e5, knight c4, queen e2, but black has d5 here to sort of save the day. And it turns out that our bishop on a3 is actually working against us. If we play e takes d6, black is going to be able to capture this bishop and save the material, and once again is going to be able to free up the position and have a pretty good game. So, is all hope lost for white? Well, of, of course it isn't, or else I wouldn't recommend this line. I like white's position after the move f4. With c5, black has prematurely shut down this diagonal, so there's no reason for us to commit this bishop over to a3 when we can be doing more useful things in the center. All right, in the game we're looking at here, we have knight c6 by black, and then surprise idea number two is going to strike. It turns out if white takes the slow approach with something like knight f3, at the end of the day, let's say queen e2, let's say uh, rook c8, for example, and something like e5. Um, sorry, I'm going a bit wrong here. d5, I think, was the line that was giving me some consternation. Uh, black is able to open up the position sort of in a way that is going to be favorable to black, right? Why is that? Well, we just don't have this pressure down this diagonal that we used to have, right? We just don't have that anymore. And I might be misremembering the exact line that was giving me trouble, but that is in general the problem here. By playing c5 first, by allowing, uh, by preventing uh, this pawn from having to step to d6, black is able to open up the position a lot more favorably and a lot more quickly compared to the previous variations. So what should we do instead? How can we solve this problem? Well, we can preemptively uh, open up things sort of on our own terms. How do we do that? Well, it's with the surprising move d takes c5. And here, I think that white is doing absolutely fine. Do I think white is better? I don't think white is actually that much better. Uh, of course, against perfect opening play, white should never really be too much better. But uh, I do think white is going to have a good game here. And once again, it's just going to be tricky for black to enact those plans that black is comfortable with, that they're familiar with the normal plans in the position. They're not going to be working out here. They're not going to be comfortable. And that's the type of opening that I find works best in a practical sense. So what happens after d takes c5? Well, black sort of has a few options here. Uh, really, it, it comes down to two options. Black can recapture the pawn or black can leave this pawn sitting on c5, and I want to talk about both really quickly. So let's say knight a5 is black's choice. This is perhaps the most natural idea for players with the black pieces in this position. Whenever d takes c5 is played, you generally are trying to get white to take here as well, and then you're going to find plenty of compensation on these open files, and I tend to agree with this assessment which is why I think we should now revert to our idea of bishop a3. And that is sort of at its core the idea of d takes c5. Black is shutting down this diagonal, 
but he's doing so in a manner that allows us to rip it back open if we so desire using this d takes c5 idea. And this, I think, is going to turn out to be pretty good for, uh, for white here. Uh, once again, we sort of have two options. Black can take on c5 or let it sit. And if black decides it's time to take back, now white can, in fact, just take this pawn. And after d6, come back with bishop b4. And after bishop takes c4, knight f3. And I let my computer at home think on this position for some time. And it is close to equal, but if anybody has a pull, according to my engine, it is going to be white. And that makes some intuitive sense here, right? Black is left with a weakness on d6, is left with some pressure on this diagonal. White is left with a weakness on c3, and black has some active pieces on the queen side, right? So both players have some pluses and minuses, but I personally believe that white's pluses outweigh the minuses in this position because largely this pressure on d6 is still here. And in a practical sense, we are achieving our main plan of pressuring this diagonal. And that is more valuable than I can, well, I can't stress enough how valuable that is to be able to stick to your actual main plan that you're comfortable with. Why is that? Well, in a practical game, the more you play one plan, the more comfortable you become with the nuances, the more you understand it, the better moves you tend to make. And so if you can steer the game into the sort of game that you're comfortable with, you're just going to be playing a lot better. Uh, and that is why I think this line is so good for white. I think most often this is actually the type of opposition you're going to face in this particular variation. This plays with the black pieces. I know myself because I play this line. We tend to just go knight a5, bishop a6 against everything. And in this case, I do think white is ending up on the slightly better side of things here. So that's d takes c5 and knight a5 that I just talked about. Once again, the game continues with bishop a3. And now I was saying if black recaptures this pawn, white is slightly, slightly better. What happens if white doesn't or black doesn't recapture this pawn? Well, let's say bishop takes on c4. Now it is going to be time to take on b6. d6 is the only way to not lose the rook. And then here, white can go a little bit crazier and even take on a7. And what's going on in this position? Well, I didn't analyze this one quite as deeply because I think this is a lot harder for a human opponent to willingly go into with the black pieces. Why is that? Well, white is actually going to be the one up upon here. We're going to get all the same pressure against d6, and it comes at the cost of one, maybe two tempi. Uh, play might continue, something like queen c7, knight f3, queen a7 and something like knight d4, or perhaps queen e2. And it's, again, just going to be a chess game. Uh, I don't think white is significantly better, but I definitely don't think white is going to be on the worst side of things here. Also notably, uh, taking this pawn is not necessarily uh, a requirement by white. If you're not so comfortable going for the super crazy stuff, you can also just develop your pieces here, something like knight e2. But probably white should be taking this pawn. Uh, okay, so that's what happens if knight a5. There is one more idea I want to briefly mention before getting to what happens if black does just take this pawn back, and that is this move e5. Uh, this is an idea that hasn't cropped up in this exact position before, but has shown up before, and this is going to change the structure ever so slightly. Uh, so what's going on? Well, white, again, should just continue with normal development. And now black is going to be taking back on c5. If black doesn't, then it really is getting to the point where white can just take on b6. So takes, castles, now d6 is the natural continuation. And here I'm going to recommend the move f5. And I just wanted to introduce this position to you because structures like this do occasionally happen when you are playing this move d takes c5. So what's going on in this structure? Well, again, black is saddled with a weakness on d6 under slightly different circumstances this time. And the difference now is that our bishop is not heading to a3, but instead will likely come out to the g5 square. Um, is white any better in this position? Again, these positions are, are really difficult, and I honestly don't think computers are the best at them. Sort of, this is the type of position where stockfish 
and uh, you know Magnus Carlsen might agree on, might disagree on the evaluation. That's that's all I'm trying to say. Things are very very blocked, and it's more a game about slow p positional maneuvering than anything else. But I do think I like White's chances here in particular because this pawn on d6 is a permanent weakness, and this pawn on c4. While it is also a weakness, it can really only be attacked the two times. It's going to be difficult for black to add another attacker there. But with all that in mind, let's get to our main game here, which continued with b takes c5. Uh, and I do think this makes a lot of sense by black in particular to lock these pieces here, and also because this idea of bishop a3 is a little bit frightening for black to deal with, right? In combination with a4, d takes c5 is seriously op threatening to open up this diagonal. White again should continue naturally with knight f3, and that's what happened in our main game. Now knight a5 by black, and here we are actually going to deviate from the example game. In the example game, white castled kingside, sacrificed this pawn, and had to work pretty hard to get it back. Uh, so instead, let's take a look at the more natural move, which is queen e2. I like this a bit better just defending this pawn, and now black is, again, not so easily able to add another attacker. Notably, knight d6 here would be a mistake in light of e5 when this is awkward, and this is even more awkward, right? We've seen this Greek gift sacrifice before, and again, it is going to be working here. So what should black do instead? Well, we've seen the structure after e5. Now it's time to look at the structure after this move f5. This is what I think, uh, uh, this is another really important structure to be familiar with in this case. And just as a short example line here, play would likely continue with something like e5. And now with this bishop again threatening to come out to a3, black should take this opportunity to remove this bishop on c1, probably develop out with something like queen a5, and now I think white is on the better side of things one, uh, once again with the surprising move h4. Uh, once again, it's going to be a long chess game. There's going to be, um, th there's just a lot of chess left to be played here that is not going to be in the realm of opening theory or opening ideas. What I can tell you about this middle game, black is going to be looking to pressure down the b file. And in the meantime, expect to see h5, h6 by white. And then I think white is going to tend to be better in the ensuing structures. Why is that? Well, in any end game that comes up, if this pawn on h6 is still standing on the board, the black king is going to have some weaknesses that it has to account for. Uh, this pawn on h6 is going to be a, a very nice attacker, not in the tra traditional sense, where white is going to put you know, things like queen g3, knight g5, an attack like this. But later on, you can imagine a piece sneaks into the seventh rank, you know, the d7 pawn gets moved, and then all of a sudden black is, is getting checkmated. That tends to be the benefit to having this pawn pushed so far up the board. Is it a huge advantage? Definitely not. But once again, I think black is going to have to be the one who's playing very, very carefully in this position. So that is sort of my structural approach to this line with um, 9c5. There are a few really important, structure, really important structures to keep in mind. Number one, uh, knight c6, we're taking on c5. Structure number one we looked at was knight a5, and here we are happy to open up this diagonal with bishop a3. Structure number two was what happens after e5, and here we are just going to look to put some pressure on the d7 pawn, soon to be d6 pawn, and potentially expand on the king's side further. And lastly, structure number three arose after um, b takes c5. And here I wanted to mention this structure with f5, e5. A lot of the plans are going to be the same. But here, white has this nice little plan of playing h4, h5, h6, and putting a little thorn in black's side. So that is going to conclude my analysis of the surprising knight e8 variation. Um, let me know what you guys think. I think I did a pretty good job of covering it in depth. Uh, keep in mind that idea I first looked at as well, which instead of knight e8 was the move c5. And remember that knight e8 often gets played because this move bishop g5 by white just provokes some awkward weaknesses, some awkward moves like d6 e5 by black that black really isn't so interested in playing. 
Um, we are going to continue the series next week. And next week, I'm hoping to dive ahead first into the uh, difficult line, which is for C5 by Black. That's where sort of the craziest games are going to arise. And that's where a lot of fun is to be had for both sides. Um, but that's going to do it. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this edition of Chess Openings Explained. If you're watching live, please head over to the Twitch channel for a special edition of Tactics Time. If you're watching the YouTube video, that is going to do it for tonight. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.